The Travel Transformation Podcast is proud to be partnered with Give the Goodness Global, an amazing global outreach project helping families in need all over Southeast Asia and beyond. Please check them out at instagram.com forward slash give the goodness global today. And now on to the podcast episode. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, the podcast that explores the life-changing potential of solo travel, intentional travel, and location-independent working. Whether you're an aspiring digital nomad or simply want to boost your confidence through epic travel experiences, I'm here to motivate and inspire you to go after all your wildest dreams. I'm Jessica Grace Coleman, author, travel transformation coach, founder of the Travel Transformation Company, and your host for the Travel Transformation Podcast. Travel changed my life. Now let's change yours. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation. My name is Jessica Grace Coleman, and I'm your host. And today I'm talking to Brittany Roberts, travel coach and founder of Sojourner Travels. Brittany does so many things in the travel space, but in this episode, we talked a lot about her experience of teaching on a reservation in Arizona, including the pros and cons and how others can do the same. It really does sound like an incredible experience. With this in mind, Brittany is passionate about teaching people how they can have transformative travel experience and even experience an entirely different culture in depth without having to move abroad. We also talk about the difference between traveling and sojourning and how we can respectfully participate in other cultures and work with indigenous owned businesses. I met Brittany in person last October when she came to the UK. We met up in Manchester and we had pizza and wine and we talk all things travel and travel coaching. And she also gave me loads of tips on how to start a podcast because I was just about to launch mine. She really helped me out and encouraged me to get my episodes out there. So I'll always be grateful for that. I learned a lot during this conversation and I think you will too. So let's get to the interview. Hi, Brittany. Welcome to the podcast. How are you? Hi, I'm doing so well. Thank you for having me. And how are you? I'm good, thank you. And thank you for coming on. Just to let the listeners know, we have actually met in person, which isn't usual for me when I interview someone on Zoom. So it's nice to see your face, like rather than just behind the keyboard. So before we get into all that, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and where in the world you are right now? Yeah, so nice to meet you all, at least me in quotes. So I currently live in Tucson, Arizona, obviously from the United States, you can tell from my accent originally from Southern California. And that's going to come into my story too. And about what we talk about a little bit here, as far as where I am now, it depends on when you're listening to this. I'll be in Puerto Rico next month. I'll be hosting sailing retreats in June and July. So I'm everywhere. I'm always traveling. (laughs) Nice. That's the way to be really, isn't it? (laughs) I just want to tell listeners a bit about how we actually met because you're part of the Travel Coach Network, which I joined last year. And you happened to be in the UK around October time and you did a sort of meetup. But the weather was horrible. It was like pretty great British weather, rainy, bleak, grey. I was the only one who could come. So in the end, we just met up and we had pizza and wine and we talked all things travel and all things travel coaching. It was really great. And I just want to point this out because I remember it was right before I launched this podcast. And I remember asking you so many questions about podcasts and tools and platforms and websites and all that kind of stuff. And you were so helpful and so encouraging about it. So thank you. I just thought that was a really cool full circle moment that you're now on the podcast. <laughs> so I just wanted to point that out. That's really cool. Oh, thank you. And, and I just want to add about that too. If anyone's listening, because I know that there are people who maybe are travel coaches themselves or they want to be a travel coach. A podcast is such an amazing thing. And you know, it's never going to be perfect from day one, no matter what you do, right? So you might as well just put yourself out there. I feel like that's my life motto. Just put yourself out there. See what happens. You never know what could come of it. I've had some amazing connections in the Travel Coach Network because of podcasting or helping others start theirs. So I'm so glad that we met and that we're here. Yeah, me too. And you're right. It's so good for networking. Definitely all that stuff. It's amazing. So you run Sojourner Travels. Can you tell me a little bit about that, what it's about, why you started it, all that good stuff? Yeah. So I actually have several blogs because I'm a crazy person. (laughs) I'm very busy, but it's also, they all have a, a similar theme. Just like how our podcast is titled, like I really do believe that travel is a tool for transformation. I think how that looks is so different. So there are some members of my audience who are teachers. A lot of them actually are. And I originally started because I wanted to just share what I knew with teachers before I even knew what a business was really. I just made a Facebook group. I had a blog, which I didn't really know much about it back then when I started. I had to go back and update a whole bunch of things. But I really just wanted to share with teachers what was possible because 
I heard from so many of the teachers at the school I worked at, which is also a big part of my story. I lived and taught on a reservation for five years, which if you're not familiar, it's where the indigenous Native Americans would live. And that's there's a whole bunch of history behind that, which I won't get into right now. But because I lived there and because the area is usually seen as kind of impoverished, it was in really poor form to talk about these like amazing trips, right? Like it's something I wouldn't really talk about there, but I knew I wanted an outlet for it. I knew I wanted to talk about it. And I knew there were other people out there in similar situations where maybe their families didn't understand like that it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And it's actually like to keep you sane and excited for everything else going on. I also wanted to combat the belief travel has to be super expensive because it doesn't. I wanted for teachers to have this experience and I wanted for them to know it was possible. So I started out by talking about grants and fellowships and all these opportunities that teachers have to travel for free. And so I grew an audience there. I have about 5,000 people in that Facebook group right now. People were like, hey, we want to travel together. And I said, okay, let me figure out how to do that. So then I started figuring out how to host the trips and I became a travel agent just so I could figure out all the legal stuff and back end. And then other people were like, hey, we want to start travel blogs too. And I said, okay. So then I find the people to start coming into the group. I had Sahara come in. Basically, I followed my audience, whatever they wanted, right? And I was like, if that's aligned with me, then let's do it and let's figure it out. So that's why I ended up having a few different projects. I have traveling teachers, which is the trips and like the budget travel advice for teachers, because also a lot of general budget travel advice doesn't work for us. Travel during the off season, can't do it if you're a teacher. You only have designated breaks, right? So there's that. And then I also have Teach Blog Travel, which is more so about living and teaching and traveling on reservations, because that was something I ended up getting a lot of questions about. And so I said, okay, I'm going to make this separate thing over here because I really didn't want that to be like a for-profit project. I wanted it just for the information because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know about American history and how that affects what's going on today. And I've done all kinds of other things since then, which I know that you know. I'm also a podcast manager. I do content for people. So I do lots of fun things. You do so much stuff. Like whenever I see you post online, I'm like, oh, how does this woman have the time? <laughs> like, It's amazing. But I mean, that's what stops it from becoming boring or mundane or routine, I guess. Like I have lots of stuff going on as well. I sort of moan about it sometimes, but I definitely prefer that way. Like having lots of pies, <laughs> lots of focus and pies. So I'd love to hear more about your experience living and teaching on a reservation. Now, you mentioned it a little bit there, but can you explain exactly what it is? Because obviously in the UK, we don't have anything like reservations. So some of our listeners might not even know what this entails or how the communities live and work together and that kind of stuff. Could you explain it a little bit? Sure. It's not just folks in the UK. There are a lot of folks here in the United States that don't really understand it, especially if you live in an area where there aren't a lot of reservations. I live in the Southwest, right? So in California, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, there's a lot more exposure to it. So totally understandable if you don't. But basically, if you look at the history of our country and we look at like the colonization that happened and colonialism in general, a lot of people were pushed into what we would call reservations or like Canada calls them reserves. And it's designated land where then U.S. government negotiated with the tribal peoples and said, we're going to settle in these lands over here. Basically, this is consolation. And that's a a real short version of it. There's a lot more to it there. Sometimes people were actually taken away from their homelands and actually pushed somewhere else. Like if you've read about the Trail of Tears, or if you're interested, you can go read about that. People from Florida, the Seminole tribe were actually pushed way west. So you have like people who are from originally what is now Florida in Oklahoma. It's really fascinating, sad stuff. But because of this interesting conflict and reliance between tribal nations, which are sovereign nations, and the U.S. government, you have this interesting thing on a reservation where They are completely sovereign. They get to run it however you'd like. There's actually different tribal laws. So when I was living on the Fort Apache Reservation, the White Mountain Apache tribe, they get to dictate what's legal, what's not, as long as it doesn't go against federal laws. Like obviously, you know, murder is still legal, things like that. But as far as like how drugs are handled or what we would call drugs are handled, that's very different. Religious practices, those things are very different there. So yeah, it's a sovereign nation, but it's still in the United States. It's really interesting because a lot of people think you have to move abroad to go experience a different culture or have that transformational experience, but you actually don't have to. You could even go and learn from people there. And it is full immersion. It is completely different. Their own language, their own religion, their own practices. So that's the gist of it. So my grandmother who raised me was actually Native as well. She was from the Shawnee tribe. When she passed away in 2016, I was working at a community center. And it totally wrecked me. She was my mom and my dad, basically. I had this total shift of priorities. I had been working like 40 or actually no 80 hours a week at this nonprofit. 
And I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. Like life is short. I don't want to miss my siblings growing up. I don't want to retouch with my mom. I want to have these connections because relationships are really important to me. And so I started looking at other jobs and I was like, oh, teaching, they get lots of time off. That sounds easy, right? <laughs> Which is very naive. But I was like, yeah, I could do that. I have a lot of energy. I love kids. That's fine. Let's do it. So I started looking at teaching jobs. Partially, I was put off by the pay because in Arizona and in the US, we're not paid. Teachers aren't paid very well. But Arizona was so low. And I also wanted to be closer to my mom. My mom lives right next to the Fort Apache Indian Reservation on the non-reservation side. And so she kind of like threw out the idea. She's like, why don't you go work on the reservation? And I was like, hmm. And I was thinking about it. And I'm like, you know, my grandma didn't get to grow up with her heritage and culture. So she tried to grab it where she could. You know, she was born in the 40s. Interracial marriage wasn't legal or okay back then in the U.S. So she was kind of robbed of that part of her heritage. So we grew up going to, to powwows, to artisan fairs, wherever we could. And so when my mom proposed that to me, I was like, wow, it's kind of full circle, isn't it? Like I have this connection to my grandma that I can really like honor by being there. I'm going to be closer to my mom so I can have a relationship with her. And as an extra perk and bonus, schools on reservations tend to pay more, sometimes double what they do in the rest of the state. They offer really cheap housing. So I had a three bedroom house for $350 a month. Wow. <laughs> so for pounds, that's like 500 pounds a month. Can you imagine having a three bedroom house for that's that much? Crazy. You'd be like, how is this possible? It was like the stars aligned and I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I applied to a couple schools there, drove out, and it was like the most interesting experience and interview I ever had because I didn't even sit down really a lot. We were actually touring the school and talking to students, talking to teachers, which I thought was really smart of them to do. At the end of it, I just felt really at ease and I was like, yeah, this already feels like, oh, let's do it. And I got offered the job on the spot. It was the quickest job process. Like when you talk about like meant to be, everything just fell into place. And I ended up being there for five years. I learned a lot. And I'm happy to share if you have any specific questions about that. But that's kind of how I ended up there. Then when I talk to other teachers or other people, even who aren't teachers, that seems to be the thing that they're most interested in. Like, how did you end up there? Because I've had so many interesting experiences. I don't think most people would have just living in the United States, not having that. And I also learned a lot. I learned a lot about our own shared history of our nation. It's just been an incredible experience. And I just... My main takeaway, if I could tell anybody, you don't have to go live, move, teach abroad to live in a completely different culture, to have your own beliefs challenged, to really challenge yourself with change. I can go on and on, but go ahead, Jessica. Do you have any questions or anything to add? I love that whole idea of you don't have to go very far to go abroad, to immerse yourself in a different culture and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to say that you sent me a video that you put together about the reservation and teaching and everything and your views out the back in the backyard with the horses and the sunset. Amazing. So beautiful. I can totally see why you stayed there for five years. How big are these reservations? I mean, I guess it differs in terms of how they're laid out, where people live, where you were staying, how big they are in general, like just to give us an idea. Yeah, it's a good question. And it does vary a lot. Out West, obviously, we have more land that's outspersed, right? That's not like settled. So the reservations tend to be bigger. The Navajo Nation, for example, is really big. I mean, it spans, I want to say four states, like the Four Corners area. Just to give you a sense, if you were living in the Navajo Nation, you could be three hours from a small town. Like you could be living in such a rural area that it takes you three hours. It's almost like if you've ever been to Australia, how there's just so much land open in the middle. It's very similar to that. The specific reservations are so different. Like that one, what makes that one so unique, Fort Apache, it's very close to a small mountain town. Which is a trip in itself, because when we look at this mountain town, this is where like the wealthier or upper middle class go to have their summer homes. Okay, so you drive, except for my mom, my mom got in when it was still cheap. So she lives <laughs> with all these nice houses around her. But it's funny. So when I go visit them, you see these beautiful houses, manicured yards, you have the nice fences. And the dogs are in the yards, everything is just what you would imagine like middle class to be people are going out to brunch, all these things. You drive 40 minutes south, it's a completely different world. It's very rural. It's There's not a lot going on. Alcohol is actually illegal. So that was interesting. So you didn't have any bars or anything there. It's just such a trippy experience. So as far as how big it is, it depends. I know that specific reservation has about 10,000 citizens, but they're spread out. Because if we think about too, like the early settling of like nations, how long it would have taken to get anywhere, right? So where I was in White River, Arizona, if you had gone even 45 minutes more south, you would get to a place called the Shubaco, which what we would call is deep res, or you would hear like Apache folks say deep res. They actually speak Apache in everyday life when they're in the classroom. 
it's very different experience even than the school I taught at, which was state run. So the type of school you teach at would make it a different experience to where you live. But because where I was was so close to that, I do think that impacted the culture just because the Apache had more of an interaction with the settlers coming in. In fact, if you're really interested, go Google Geronimo and you'll learn a lot about where I was because that was the place where he's from. Oh, wow. Cool. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned the Navajo there in Four Corners. When I was 10, I went to the US. We went with like, a, my family did like a, a road trip for two weeks. It was like the most amazing holiday. We went to the Four Corners. We met the Navajo. My mom was obsessed with their jewelry. Like she bought so much stuff and we talked to them for ages. And then I remember my brother we didn't really have the internet then, but we had Encarta 95. I don't know if you had that in America. It was like an Wikipedia CD that you'd put in your computer. And he made us all the Navajo phrases. <laughs> so that's like my memory of it. I remember thinking how different sort of you said it's sort of like going into a different culture, but you're still in the States and all that kind of thing. It was really interesting to me because obviously in the UK, we don't learn much about that US history. It got me thinking. Recently, I've been traveling in Europe and South Africa and things like that. And I meet so many travelers who know so much more about like the British Empire and colonialism and stuff like that than me. Like they can talk for hours about it. And I, I can be like, I don't didn't know half this stuff because we just don't get taught it in school. Like they leave out the bad bit. I assume or I've heard that it's similar in the US in schools. They leave out a lot of the stuff and they don't don't learn it. So what is your take on this and how is it different in the reservation? Like, do they learn absolutely everything? Do, you, do they put like a big emphasis on that um, when they're learning about the history of the US and that kind of stuff? Yeah. And I want to add to what you said too about they don't teach it. I think that is true, but it also depends on where you live because I grew up close to the Torres Martinez reservation. So I think I had more exposure where I was than maybe someone who lives in New York and they're in New York City, right? Where there are no reservations directly around them. They'd have to drive a little bit. So I think where you live in the U.S., the U.S. is such a massive country. Like if you haven't been, it's kind of hard to fathom, especially if you're from Europe, because we have 330 million people. You know, it's like we have 50 different countries, really, in the States. I mean, they're so different. So I think partially it's just that you can't teach what you don't know, right? Like if you don't know it, you can't teach it. And so it's a cyclical thing of nobody learns. And so it doesn't get taught. And then the way you teach it, I think people are scared to teach it, honestly, because everybody's so scared of getting things wrong. And that's another thing where it's like, you kind of have to get over yourself there because you'll just figure something out. If you're wrong, somebody will correct you. It's not, it's not a big deal. But I did learn a lot and I don't know if it was because of them knowing more, although it was more recent. I'll talk about that in a second. But I think it's also just because if it's more relevant to you, you know what I mean? Like with think about the British Empire and colonialism, for example, someone in India is likely, not necessarily, but likely to have a different take on that than someone in the UK, right? Because their ancestors are going to be impacted by that. So I think just like how in the U.S., if someone is Navajo or Apache, they're going to have a different view than someone who's just traveling through or through someone who's an outsider coming to live there. I think people want to teach, but I think people are scared of getting things that aren't factual, too, because it's hard to find those sources unless you go directly to the tribe. Like, I'll give you an example. Teachers Pay Teachers is a website where teachers go and get like their lesson plans and activities. And it's really hard to put anything related to tribal history up on there because it always gets flagged as like, we're not sure if this is like, if this is appropriate. So we don't know if we can have you sell it on here because everybody's so scared of getting in trouble or saying the wrong, which I can understand where they're coming from with that. But then it's like, it just makes people say, well, we won't talk about it then because we don't want to get it wrong. So I think that's part of it is part of it's not knowing part of it is where do you go to learn? And then, yeah. And I think we have to be willing, we have to be willing to get things wrong. That's just like cultural competence, right? You have to be willing to get things wrong and say, I'm sorry and make mistakes to be able to learn anything. That's probably the biggest reason why. Yeah, totally agree. You mentioned this a bit before with perks, like the cost of the housing and the pay. I saw on your website that you had a blog post on the perks and benefits of teaching on a reservation. So can you tell us what some of the other benefits are, in your opinion? Yeah. Well, okay. So I'm going to start with affordable health care, which if you're in the UK, you're like, oh, we've already got that, you know. But here in the United States, that is a big deal. I've had procedures where I've gotten like a medical bill for $50,000. Like, thankfully, learn how to fight insurance companies, but and it's sad that you have to do that, right? Like a lot of times if you're not insured, you do everything you can to not go to a doctor. I mean, like, because you're just scared of the cost, to be honest. So when I got sick on the reservation, I remember being so scared because I was like, I have to go. So I had to get a doctor's note to be able to go back to work if I was okay, right? So I had to go to the doctor's office and I went to what's called IHS, Indian Health Services. And I remember just being like, oh, I'm going to basically pay for them to tell me I'm not feeling well. It's like, I already know I'm not feeling well. Well, they paid for it. The tribe just paid for it. And I remember walking out of there, my prescription was like $9 or something like that. And I was stunned because that would have easily cost me $30, $40, $50 if I had been 30 miles, 40 miles north. 
So that was really amazing. And they pay for it for tribal members and for community members. So if you're a teacher, if you're a nurse that works on the reservation, which I think is a really beautiful thing because they totally don't have to do that. But I think it's like just an extension of hospitality in a way and an additional perk, which is really cool. So obviously affordable housing is also a good one. I talked a little bit about that. So how that works, it's interesting because the state of Arizona actually leases the land from the tribe, right? Because the tribe owns it. So the tribe could just be like, no, at any time, but they have like this 20, 30 year lease, something like that. And so the state actually subsidizes, I think it's state and also probably federal, they're subsidizing the actual housing costs. So the housing total cost is probably like 1200 a month or something like that. But because it's on the reservation and because there's so much like grant funding and things, because the government's trying to make up for what it did. So there's a lot of funding that goes to reservations. So that's why it's so cheap, which is really nice if you're wanting to like save for a house or pay down student debt. We had teachers from all over the world there. So we had teachers who would come from like somewhere like the Philippines, but the cost of living is so much lower, right? They would come, they'd bank their money for five years, go back and retire at like 35, which is amazing. We had teachers from countries like Jamaica who would just send most of it home because they could afford to. The cost of living was so low there. And then we had some teachers who just wanted to travel. Like we had two teachers from the Netherlands who just came because they wanted to travel the Southwest. So they would just go use their three-day weekends. Oh, we also had four-day work weeks towards the end. So that was pretty sweet too. <laughs> and then also culturally, I would say, this is something that really took me a long time to be okay with because I feel like, especially in like the UK and like probably Anglo-Saxon culture in general, we're very time focused. You know what I mean? Like we're usually, we're taught to be prompt. Like if you're on time, you're late kind of thing. So this concept of what they call Indian time really got to me because the meeting starts at two. No, it doesn't. It starts at two 30. So I would be early. I'd be there at one fifty, waiting. Like I want to be a good employee. And then like, where is everybody? And it was because everybody comes later. So first I didn't see that as a perk, but later I did because it forced me to slow down and not prioritize work as much because that's also a cultural thing. Work is important, but it's not the most important thing. Like family comes first. If someone is sick and you need to stay home, it's understood. If there's a funeral, their funerals are very long processes. Like they last honestly for a couple of weeks. They have so many things they have to do. So if someone passes away, it's just understood. When I wanted to take a day off at the job in Phoenix, I was so scared to do it. Even just a day off to like go get my dental work done. You know what I mean? Like there's so much pressure to be working and productive all the time. And on one hand, that's a good thing. I don't want to say that's bad, but having the other side is good too. So I'm really thankful I got to experience that, what it's like to live more slowly. And obviously it's beautiful. Like Jessica already touched on that. I mean, go look at the pictures or go to the blog just so you can see it. It's kind of hard to explain, like, especially if you live in a city, like if you live in Manchester or London and you can't even fathom having that much open space behind you, you know what I mean? So Having that and just being like, wow, this is like a $2 million view. If I had a house with this view in Montana, easily the house would be $2 million. So I think that was a gift in itself. Obviously being invited to some of these cultural things. I've been invited to a sunrise ceremony, which is when a girl is recognized as a woman by the tribe. I've been prayed over by Apache elders, which a lot of these things were unexpected. So I wouldn't have had those opportunities had I not been there doing the work of like building relationships and really trying to understand I really do think I'm a better person for it. I learned so much. I mean, I'm still learning, even though I'm not there, but I'm just really thankful. So many perks. It's even hard to call them perks. I feel like perks is too light of a word, but yeah, ton of benefits there. Well, I mean, you're making it sound incredible. If anyone has listened to this and is a teacher and would like to try this, what would you recommend doing to start with? I know you've got some resources and things like that. I just want to interrupt this awesome podcast episode for a moment to tell you about Write Your Life, the ultimate life hack for achieving your dreams by Jessica Grace Coleman, a book that teaches you how to design your dream life and then go live it. Life is what you make it. Life is what you write it to be. And you can write whatever you want. Let me show you how. The Write Your Life method gives you all the tools and techniques you need to identify your ambitions, plan your goals, and ultimately achieve all your wildest dreams all while having fun and getting creative. And you don't need to be a writer to benefit from the Write Your Life method. This book can help anyone, anywhere, design their ultimate dream lifestyle. Get it now from Amazon or head to www.traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash books. You'll also get a digital copy completely free when you sign up to the Flip the Script Academy at traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash academy where we teach you that life is short. So let's make sure it's nothing short of amazing. And now let's get back to the Travel Transformation Podcast. So I would say go read the blog post first because 
it is amazing, but it's also hard. I don't want to paint the picture that it's all easy because if you've ever moved to another country, if you have done that, or even if you've just traveled to a place that's different and dealing with culture shock, confronting your own beliefs of what's good and what's true, that that's really hard internal work, right? So I don't want to paint the picture like it's not hard, but I think it's worth it. So I would go read the blog post because that's free and that's a good way for you to get information. I also have the res teacher job database. So if you want to like filter by state, by salary, whether or not housing is offered or included, that's a really good place to go to. Because I think as much as we want to have the experience, we also have to be practical and think like, do I have my needs met, right? Like, am I going to have health care? Am I going to have a place to live? Uh, can I afford to work there? And also the, the lifestyle, like, do you want to be closer to a town like I was? Do you want to be completely rural? That'll make a difference too. And that's a good resource as well. Great. And we'll put those in the show notes as well. Your business is called Sojourner Travels. What would you say is the difference between traveling and sojourning? I love that. So I would say when I think about the art of sojourning, of living somewhere for a little while or just dwelling somewhere for a little while, one, it forces you to slow down. And two, you're there at the goodwill of the people who are hosting you, right? The community. When we travel and when we're participating in tourism, which I have no shame against that. I love taking a trip or vacation. But you're there for yourself to have a good time, to experience ease and and rest and all that. But when you're sojourning, that's not really the primary goal, right? You're learning. It's an internal journey because you're learning something and you're going through something and figuring out what you believe, countering what you believe. You're slowing down and actually experiencing it as a local, which I know that we like doing that when we travel. People on this Airbnb or something, but it's different staying in Italy in an Airbnb for a week than it is living in a place and learning some of the language, learning the customs listening to people, making mistakes, repairing relationships, actually living there, I think is so different. And that's what I would say sojourning is in a nutshell, but it's still like a whole philosophy. Yeah, I love that. And um, going back to what you said about Indian time, it reminded me of uh, being in Spain last year in the Basque country and they have, they definitely have Spanish time, especially when it comes to timings and dinner and stuff like that. You could be like, we'll go for dinner at seven. It could mean eight, it could mean nine. And you know, everyone just like stops and just chills out for dinner. They can last hours. Everyone's just having a good time and talking. And whereas here, like I have dinner as quickly as possible so I can get on with all the other stuff I need to be getting on with. And it was just, it's so nice to be sort of forced to, to slow down a bit, like you say, and it all goes with that as well. I'm going there next week as well for a month to stay in the same place. So I'm going back to the same little village in the northern Spain. It's totally different when you try and immerse yourself. You go to all the local cafes, the local bars that where all the villagers hang out and stuff like that. And it's just such a completely different experience. So totally agree with that. Now, you mentioned, obviously, being on a reservation, all the cultural history, all that kind of things. And I know you talk about working with indigenous owned businesses and things like that. Could you talk a little bit and maybe give us some tips on how we can respectfully participate in another culture? Yeah, absolutely. One of the reasons I wanted to share stuff about this is because I know that not everybody can move somewhere else, right? So especially if you're in the UK or Europe, it's really hard for you to just pick up and go. And even if you're in the United States, moving to another state or moving might not be practical for you, but you might be able to take a trip there. So like how Jessica mentioned, she was able to go through the Navajo Nation. There's so much beautiful land and so many cool things to see. Like if you've heard of Page or Horseshoe Bend, Antelope Canyon, if you've heard of Monument Valley, when you think about Arizona desert, if you were to like type it in, these are the things you're probably going to see, right, that come up. And they're popular for a reason because they're awe-inspiring. Even the Grand Canyon. Did you all know that there's tribes in the Grand Canyon? There's the Hualapai, there's the Havasupai. If you go down into the canyon, you can actually see there's whole Indian communities there who have schools and lives and businesses. And it's a pretty amazing thing. So I would say the most respectful thing you can do is if you can, Just take some time to think about whose land am I on right now? Whose ancestral lands? Because even if you're not on a reservation, whenever you're in the United States, you're standing somewhere that is was ancestrally owned by a group of people and they're still here. I also want to make that super clear. It's not like these people disappeared. Like these people are still here and they're still living their lives. But I think it's just good to kind of honor that yourself and just say like, wow, like I'm a guest and I'm really grateful and thankful to be here. Another is trying to, whenever you can, as a tourist, participating with Indigenous-owned businesses. So sometimes this is required. So if you're going to Antelope Canyon, for example, the Navajo Nation has enforced that you cannot go unless you go with a Navajo guide that's approved. And I think that's great. I think that's awesome, right? Because what will often happen is colonization can extend into tourism sometimes. And, And I have to even be careful of this too, because I run trips in other places, So are you going to somewhere having experience? This isn't even on the reservation. This is anywhere. And look at the people who own the business. 
I'm not saying that you can't enjoy it if it's owned by someone else who doesn't live there, but consider that. Is there a way that you could go and support a local owned tour company? Or does that company, if they are like, say you go to a company in France, tour company, and they're owned by folks in the UK, which totally makes sense. There's nothing wrong with that. But do they work with French people there or not even just French anywhere, right? Are they really taking it upon themselves to hire locals to patron local restaurants? And that's something you could do too, is maybe with a little planning, instead of going to the restaurants that have all the reviews that have the clout on TripAdvisor and all those things, can you do a little more research, dig deeper and go to somewhere else? Like, the fry bread stands. If you ever go through Navajo Nation or the Apache country, like there's all these little stands on the side of the road and they do business differently. They don't understand digital marketing or, you know, and Google or any of this stuff. But if you just go to one of those places and just slow down and talk to people and enjoy patron their food, first of all, the food's going to be way better and fresher anyway. Second of all, you're going to be supporting a family. Like that's money that they literally take home that day, right? You're not paying for some huge overhead. So I just think even little things like that and also buying things at the price they said, I, I don't think anyone would do this, but like trying to get a deal, I get that and struggle like as a budget person, like you like want to get a good deal, but respect the prices they set because it's really hard for any kind of artist or business owner anyway, anywhere, but especially there, it's like, this is their livelihood, right? Like they're, they often don't have an online shop or something. And I'm not saying that like they couldn't, it's just practical because a lot of times, depending on where they are, electricity or internet isn't super fast or readily available. And so it's not practical for them to run business like that. So anytime you can do a little more research, for example, there's a place called Tailgate if you ever go to White River and Tailgate is not a restaurant. What it is, is people who have their trucks and they literally set up grilling on the back of their truck. It sounds like it's not legit, but you walk through and I'm telling you, it's so good. You will leave like 20 more pounds. It's amazing. (laughs) And it's more affordable because you're just paying in cash. It's great. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's some great tips there. I totally agree. It's such a great idea to go to a place instead of just go to like the famous restaurants and that kind of stuff. Just actually ask the locals, hey, where do you eat or where do you get your coffee? And just start little things like that. It doesn't take much to ask someone or even if it doesn't speak the language, you can figure it out with Google Translate and that kind of thing these days and find out where the actual locals go. And I really try and spend my money at like local places rather than the big chains and that kind of stuff. Talking a little bit about sort of travel outside of the US, I asked you where your favorite places in the world are. And I know that's such a hard question to answer. And you said, as of now, (laughs) it's uh, Western Norway, Iceland and the Grand Tetons National Park and Yellowstone. And I love Iceland. I love Yellowstone. And I also visited the Grand Tetons as well when I was over in the States, when I was in uh, my year abroad in Colorado. So beautiful. I do need to go to Norway, though. (laughs) As on my list. So why did you choose these places? Why are they so special to you? Yeah, well, for one, I love mountains. I just think there's something sacred and special and majestic about mountains, especially when they're so big, like the Tetons. You can't pass by the Tetons and not go, wow. You know what I mean? It's literally, when you talk about breathtaking, like taking your breath, that's what it does to you. It's just, they're so big and stunning. And the places are also special. Like one thing I love about Western Norway specifically is all the fjordlands and how those places, again, it's completely different because you can only reach them like by train, right? You're going through these kind of rural areas that give you a picture of what life looked like maybe even a few hundred years ago before like the Industrial Revolution, before big cities. And so I just think it's really special to sit there and kind of dream about what that time was like. I mean, gosh, Norway, Norway in general is just so amazing. You have to do it. If you can go, anyone who's listening, the Norway in a nutshell route, we went from Oslo through Flam, through a couple other places. And we ended up in Bergen. Bergen is also a beautiful town. And it's unique because it's not as cold as the rest of Norway because you have the jet street or no jet gulf, whatever that is. It goes through Iceland, Ireland, and then it goes up the coast of Norway. And so it stays a little warmer than the rest of the country. So that's just cool. Like if you're in Oslo and it's snowing, it could be raining inside in Bergen. So it's like, you know, I'll take it. If it's 10 degrees warmer, I'll take it. So yeah, really beautiful area, country. And it's just The fact that it's wild, but accessible, because I think I love wild country and I've gone backpacking and all these things, but not everybody can do that. So being able to take a train or do a road trip and being able to have accessible wilderness, I think is just so special that we get a chance to do that still. So I think that's probably what it is, a common thread. And also I love cold places, which I know not everybody does, but I would rather be cold than hot. So that's just like an extra bonus. Oh, I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, definitely would rather be cold than hot. Love mountains. So, you know, you're speaking my language, definitely. Do you have any places on your bucket list right now that you really want to go to? Do you have any plans to go to them anytime soon? Good question. So I really want to go to Japan. I've been wanting to go to Japan since I was a kid. 
And it's one of those trips that it's just a little smidgen harder to get to. So every time I go to do it, I'm like, oh, I go somewhere else faster. But you know, it's like, I really do want to go because when I go to Japan, I want to do it right. Like I really want to be there for like three weeks. I want to work myself up the coast and things. But also my husband wants to go. So that's another thing keeping me too, because I'm like, "Ah, well, if he wants to go, I don't want to go without him. So we have to wait till we can both go together, which I'm sure you all know, it's hard to coordinate trips with other people, right? So that's kind of what I'm waiting for. But I also just love natural phenomena, right? So like, I really want to go during Hanami when the cherry blossoms are blooming. That's like a dream. And another one that's like been really like sticking out lately is the Netherlands, which I know a lot. it's not as, I guess, quote unquote, sexy as a destination as other places. But I like with talking to those two girls who are from the Netherlands, they just made it sound so like, I don't know what the word is, idyllic, maybe like when you go to little villages. And then also, I really want to see the tulip blooms there because I just love flowers. So I really want to go there. And I think we're going to try to go this next spring. I'm going to try to take a small group of people. And I don't even know if I'll make it an official trip. Just more like, who wants to come with me? Let's go. So that'll be fun. Oh, nice. I, we, I'm pretty sure we're sharing the same brain because Japan is right at the top of my list as well. And I keep putting it off because I want to do it properly as well. And I want to see the cherry blossoms. So yeah, all that. And um, also, I really want to see the tulip fields. Like I keep seeing so many. You see it all the time on Instagram, don't you? It's such an Instagrammable backdrop that you, you know, you get so many people doing photo shoots there, but it looks so beautiful. So yeah, I totally get that. I believe you're going to Greece, is it this summer? Is this a sailing trip for teachers? Can you tell me about this? It sounds intriguing. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. So for the last few summers, I've been either hosting or kind of acting as a travel agent. I acted as a travel agent first, and then I ended up going myself. So we host sailing trips in Croatia and Greece, obviously, because you get to sail to the islands. And Greece, this is my first time doing one in Greece this summer. So this is like a, which is cool because they all knew it. I'm like, everybody who's coming with me, this is our first time. So I hope you like it. It's a really good group of people. And yeah, and again, that just came from having asking people like what they like, what they want to do. And we had the Croatia trips last year. We ran four weeks and a couple of people who went said, we want to Greece next summer. And I'm like, okay, guys, if I go through all the work to plan it, you all have to come. And you never know when people say they're going to do it. You're just like, okay, we'll see if you actually do. No, most of them actually did. So a lot of people who came to Croatia with me last summer, they're coming with me to Greece this summer. So I feel really grateful for that. I feel super thankful that people are trusting me. I know it's a lot of money, right? Like paying $1,400, that's money, right? So I'm really thankful and grateful that they trust me. And I'm just excited. Like whenever I tell someone, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to be in Greece for three weeks. And part of me is like, I'm working. So it's like, well, I'm going to work. But then when I think about, when I look at my life, I'm like, wow, I really am living a very privileged life. Like that's pretty amazing that I can be on a sale for three weeks. So (laughs) I'm really excited for that. Wow. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So what do you do activities during this? What do you actually do? You say you're working, obviously, you're you're hosting it, you're doing all that kind of stuff. But what else do you do while you're on the boat? <laughs> we actually learn how to sail. So we teach the people who are coming. So it's a lot of work. You know, I was really tired last summer after all that. So you learn how to sail. And then also just being a tourist, honestly, and relaxing. My biggest thing that I want for teachers to take away when they come and travel with me is one, we're not allowed to talk about work. So you have to explore who are you outside of being a teacher? Because that's something that's really, really hard for teachers in the States. And honestly, I would argue probably in Western countries, our career kind of becomes our identity. And so my goal is like, we're not going to talk about that. Who are you outside of that? What hobbies do you have? What are you interested in? Like, what do you want to talk about with people? And so it's challenging for the first couple of days. That's to be like, "Mm -mm, no work talk. But eventually people start to really appreciate it because then they're talking about the food they had and they're talking about, wow, we saw dolphins today. And they start to like live more in the moment. They start to ask more questions because I think we're also so used to talking about ourselves and not asking other people and getting to know them. So it's interesting. It's interesting to see what happens from day one to day eight. So I feel really grateful for that. And a lot of, honestly, a lot of relaxing, a lot of swimming, a lot of paddle boarding, So for them, it's more relaxing, I should say, because when they're out and doing that, I'm over here like researching stuff and working with the next group that's coming. But it's great. Honestly, I just feel so thankful and blessed that I have the opportunity. I'm so excited. Oh, yay. And do do you get any chance to relax? Like, are you like built in a few days at the end or, you know, anything to sort of do all your pebble boarding and all that kind of thing? Yeah, for sure. So for a few days after, I'm going to go up to Meteora. I've always wanted to go to Meteora, Greece. It just looks so cool. So I'm going to be exploring some places like that. I also love going to ancient places, right? So all the, there's so many temples. There's so many old cities that are just like, there's marble everywhere. That Also, that blows my mind about Athens, that they just have marbles, <laughs> marble on the streets. You're like, whoa, this is like the most luxurious thing ever. It's so cool. 
So I'll be doing that. And then I'm also going to be spending about a month in the UK afterwards. We're also be working a little bit, but it'll be at a way chiller pace, you know, mm. like a few hours a day versus like 16 hours a day. And because my sister, one of my sisters is doing a study abroad thing in London. Mm. So she was just like, come with me, stay with me. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Why not? I'll be over there anyway. So I just extended my trip. Oh, nice. That's really cool. I had two questions, but this is based on my own memory of when we were talking last year and my memory is notoriously terrible. So these might not be relevant at all. But I remember you telling me about your brief trip to Wales and trains and you love train travel. Uh, So one of my questions is, what do you love about train rides in particular? And then I think I remember you looking up your family or something while you were there looking for like stuff to do with your ancestors and things. So how did that go? Like, did you find anything out? Was it a good trip in that regard? Yeah. So first of all, everybody should go to Wales. I could not believe how many people I talked to because I was at a travel agent event in Manchester. How many folks who are from the UK, born in Manchester, raised their whole life there, had never been to Wales or Scotland. And I'm like, what? (laughs) It's like only a few hours away for you guys. I've not been there. But I'm sure it happens with Americans too, that people come over and they go to more states than we've ever seen. It's just how it goes. But Wales is just so beautiful. It's just wild still. And like with the wind and the water, the way it's shaped the land, oh, it's just so stunning. It's beautiful. So I would have gone just even for that. And so she before for Roberts and Roberts is a really common Welsh name. A couple of years ago, I went to Ireland for a trip and we saw these group of Welsh guys who you would say they were there for a stag party or we'd say bachelor party. They were drunk beyond belief. I mean, they had no idea where they were. They were having a great time. I don't even know how it came in conversation. I was like, oh yeah, last name Roberts. And they go, hey, Roberts, Welsh. And all of a sudden I was in getting free drinks for the night. It was amazing. And so one of the guys told me in like a moment of sobriety, he said, you need to go to this area, this town in Wales. And I was like, okay, man. I was like, I'm not doing that. I'm in Ireland, but thank you. I appreciate it. But then I was like, I'm going to do it though. I was like, I'm going to be in the UK. Why not? So I went to that town. And just kind of as a fun little thing for myself, I was like, oh yeah, there really are Roberts's everywhere, like law, Roberts, restaurant lover. So, so that was really fun. And I didn't plan to meet up with any cousins or anything, but I just wanted to go explore. And also because it was uh, off season, it was in October, it was beautiful because we had the fall colors and it was just quieter, which I think is probably more of what you'd expect in a small town in Northern, Northwestern Wales. So that was really cool. And then also cool in Manchester, actually, really similar thing happened. My another travel agent friend and I were at this place. It's like a beer garden, basically in Manchester. And we happened to come across a table and I was talking about that. And then they said, I'm sorry, you were Roberts too. And I was like, yeah. So she was like, oh, we're Roberts too. And I'm like, no way. So then I ended up hanging out with them for the night. So it's just fun, you know, and I'm sure that if you're American listening to this, you can really relate because a lot of us either like kind of lost that heritage or connection to like the land if we're if we have European descent, or even if you're not European descent, if you're from somewhere else, and you're like, I just don't have that connection with the land. So I think there's something really special about going to where you know, your ancestors are from you just, it's like this, this feeling of coming home, even though it's not where you're from. I had that in Norway, too. I was, I don't know how to explain it. It's I wish there was a word for it. There probably is of like, you feel it. And you're just like, ah, yeah, like I can tell my soul sees this as its home. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was home for ancestors once. It's just a really beautiful thing. Oh, I love that. And I think a lot of people spend a like a whole lifetime searching for that kind of feeling and, and don't find it. So that is really cool that you found it in Wales, definitely. And I just wanted to say, I remember when you went to Wales and you were on the train and you, you did like a reel, an Instagram reel or something with like the full, the autumn leaves going past and you were like, look at all the autumn leaves. And it made me laugh because like I always think like oh I need to go to New England or America to see amazing fall foliage and here you are coming to Wales and American loving the leaves and stuff and I was just like it's really funny how we sort of like I want to go over there you want to come over here it just made me laugh yeah it's so true and I wanted to add because I realized I didn't answer your question about train travel so I mentioned this a little bit earlier that one of the reasons I love train travel is because you get to see these beautiful places that might otherwise be inaccessible right so that's one thing really cool about Wales specifically you have these really tiny towns that are just so hard to get to. And when I say hard to get to, if you're driving, it's fine. But I am not driving when I'm in the UK. That totally freaks me out. Driving on the other side of the road. uh, Yeah, I can't do it. So I'm really reliant on trains for that as one, as a practical thing. But two, it's that slowing down. And also it's just way more chilled out. Like when you go on a flight, you have to be there so many hours before. And also because I'm American, I have to be there if I'm going between like different countries, I have to be there three hours before every single leg. And so it's just kind of tiring and it's so stiff. I mean, you know how it is. Like you have to take all your, your stuff out of your bags and it's just like, ah, train, you show up, 
15 minutes before, as long as you're on the right platform, it's fine. You just hop on. And I feel like the service is better. They seem happier to see you. I couldn't believe it. Actually, one of my trains, I think it was London to Manchester. I can't even remember which one it was. It was like 10 minutes late or maybe 15 minutes late, which I didn't even care. I was just on my phone and they were so apologetic and they like offered a credit or something for the future. And I was just like, wow, that would never happen in the States. Like they're like companies first everywhere. So I just thought it was really cool that they care about your time so much. So I don't know. Something special about training travel. If you have a chance, you really should do it, even if it's a short trip, because you're going to see probably more land than you would if you're just driving. Because when you're driving, you're seeing also the towns and the gas stations and all the people because they're there. But on a train, you get to go to some amazing places. And I really should do a blog post about like the best train trips in. And I'm going to do that, actually. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> best train trips in the US and also best train trips in the UK because you guys have some stunning land over there. So take the time and go explore it. Yeah, I do, I do moan, like most British people, I moan about our trains, but you're right. It is really good, actually. And every time I go on a train, I usually have like my laptop and I'm like, I'm just going to work or I'm going to read or something. And I always end up just staring out the window at the like <laughs> passing landscape and stuff instead, just listening to music because it's, you're right, you see so much stuff that you wouldn't normally see. So totally agree with you on that. Okay, two last quick questions. First of all, and we'll put this in the show notes as well, where can people find and follow you online? And then is there anything else you want to mention or talk about or any message you want to get across before we go? Yeah, so I'm everywhere really on the thing. But <laughs> if you're interested in the reservation stuff, I'm on Instagram at Teach Blog Travel. And that's basically the same for across platform, same for Twitter, same for my website, teachblogtravel.com. If you find our Facebook group, that's a really good place because I share not only stuff from me, but if you're interested in like following Indigenous artists or like hearing those folks' perspective on things, I share that in the group. So facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Teach Blog Travel. And that's also where I share all the other stuff. So the group's a good place to start because then you can also find all the other things. Great. Thank you. And yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been nice to see you again <laughs> in person. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Travel Transformation Podcast with me, Jessica Grace Coleman. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review and spread the word if you have friends or family who also want to transform through travel. For a chance of winning one of my books in ebook form, please review this podcast on Apple Podcasts and send a screenshot or just your name to info at traveltransformationcoach.com or at traveltransformationcoach on Instagram. I'll be picking a new winner each month and you can choose between any of my non-fiction titles including Write Your Life, Write Your Year and Intentional Travel Transformation. You can find out more about me at traveltransformationcoach.com where you can also get your free travel transformation guide and until next time I'll catch you on the flip side. Bye!